So last time we learned about how we can take the Schrodinger equation and transform it into a difference equation that we can feed into a computer that allows us to take the wave function at any time index k and move it forward to the next time index k plus 1. So the idea is that you're running over all of the x values in the grid, all those locations j, and you're moving forward from k equals 0 to k equals 1 to k equals 2 to k equals 3, etc. We call this the time evolution of the wave function because its shape is changing, right? You've got this function of x that is changing shape on the graph before your eyes. We call that the evolution of the wave function. This time evolution happens when you're not looking at the particle, which sounds like a weird thing, and trust me, it is a weird thing, but what we mean when we say it evolves while you're not looking, it means you, it evolves when you're not taking any kind of measurement. So when you are not looking at the particle, when you are simply letting it do its quantum mechanical thing, it undergoes this time evolution. But when you take a measurement, whether it's the energy, the position, the momentum, when you take a measurement on the particle, two things happen. The first thing that happens is that you find an eigenvalue of that thing that you are measuring. So if you're trying to measure energy, you get an energy eigenvalue. If you're trying to measure position, you get a position eigenvalue, etc. And you're sitting there wondering, what the heck is an eigenvalue? Eigenvalues are special values. Eigen just means particular or special. So every operator based on the, uh, excuse me, every physical measurable thing based on the problem that you have, based on the potential energy, has special values that you can get out when you measure. This is most notable regarding the energy. So if you're familiar with, from your chemistry class with, ener with electron energy levels, those energy levels are all energy eigenvalues. The, el the electron can't simply have any energy that it wants. It can only have those set specified energy values. So that's why we call it an eigenvalue. They are special values. The other thing that happens is that psi collapses down into an eigenstate, meaning you take this beautiful, wonderful psi that you have spent uh, the last you know, several minutes of computer time evolving the wave function into, and you collapse that shape down to the eigenstate associated with that eigenvalue. So every eigenstate has an associated eigenvalue and vice versa. Let me show you an example. Let's suppose you're interested in measuring position. Right? The way we're going to show that you are measuring position is with the position operator, capital X. Capital X is different than the lowercase x over here. Because the way this works, when you take your position operator and you act on a position eigenstate, so this x0 here is a position eigenstate, with eigenvalue x0. So x0 is some special point. It's the thing that you're measuring, right? You go looking for the particle, you find it at x0. What you end up with is the same state back times x0. This is not true for every state, right? Your wonderful, beautiful state psi that you've been time evolving on your computer simulation for the last, uh, you know, maybe an hour, hour or two, it, that's not going to work with this because it's not guaranteed to be an eigenstate. But what happens is that we take that psi and we collapse it down. We force it to be one of these eigenstates that spits out this eigenvalue. The way it works for a position eigenvalue is that it has to be the direct delta function delta x minus x0. So it is a spike at x0 that is infinitely high and infinitesimally wide at x0 and 0 everywhere else on the wave function. Uh, I'll have a link in the description below to a video about the Dirac Delta function. It is the physicist's favorite tool and the mathematician's nightmare, which means we love it. Same thing can happen with the momentum. Let's suppose you're measuring the particle's momentum P. That's my best attempt at a capital P there. In that case, you're going to have a momentum eigenstate, a momentum eigenstate with an eigenvalue p0. All right, in that case, what you're trying to do is take the momentum operator operating on a momentum eigenstate can equal the momentum eigenvalue times the same eigenstate. Again, this doesn't work for any old state psi that you create. Psi can satisfy the Schrodinger equation and it doesn't care about this relationship. But when you measure the momentum, psi collapses down to this p0, and it turns out that this p0 
in position space is given by e to the i p0x divided by h bar. Now why are those so different? Because this operator is just akin to multiplying by x, but this operator p is akin to taking h bar over i and then a derivative with respect to x. So even though x gets to stay in its normal self right there, multiplying by position, the momentum gets transformed into this. And in fact, you can even prove that for yourself here if you have, take this thing, so take your h bar over i d psi dx and act on p0, e to the i p0x over h bar, right? You take your derivative with respect to x here. Taking the derivative of an exponential is the easiest thing in the world. You just spit out everything that's multiplying x. So I'll have an i p0 over h bar e to the i p0x over h bar. These h's cancel, the i's cancel. You're left with p0 times the original wave function. Right? So if you have p0 times the original wave function, that's just p0 times this state. Boom, you have an eigenvalue. Eigenvalues, it sounds complicated at first, but once you actually work one out, you say, oh, it's a thing that stays the same. Right? It's a magic state that stays the same under the influence of an operator. So what we're going to add to our code, we're going to add these two steps to our code. So when you take a measurement, you're going to find an eigenvalue, and then psi is going to collapse into an eigenstate. So here in line 93 of the code is where we're going to set up these consequences for taking measurements. The first thing we'll set up is how to measure x. So we need to pull in some of our lists. I need to pull in x and the psi modulus and dx. And basically what we're going to do is set up a Dirac delta function. Now you can't actually program in a Dirac delta function because you can't tell the computer to make an infinitely tall, infinitesimally thin spike. But you can approximate it with a Gaussian. So down here is where we've got our Gaussian function. So we've got e to the negative x minus a special x value squared. And it's control the width and height are controlled by this epsilon factor here. So we have to set epsilon to be a very small number. So we might as well set it to be dx, our step size, right? You can change it if you want, but it kind of just makes sense to make that the width of the delta function it would be one unit along the grid. So before we can get there, though, we have to pick what value this x is. And although it's going to be an eigenvalue, it's going to be ran a randomly determined eigenvalue. So we need to pick a random number up here. We're going to set that equal to r. And now the thing is, this random function returns you a uniform random variable between 0 and 1. We need to transform that to a random variable uh, within the range of x values that meets the probability distribution for x. So it's not distributed uniformly, it's distributed according to this psi m. So we're going to do that using a little integration trick here. So here's where we're going to integrate to turn the uniform random variable into a random variable of x based on our probability density psi m. So here we loop over all of our values of the x list. So it could, so the eigenvalue we return could be any one of these x values. We're keeping track of a sum quantity. The sum is just the integral of this psi m squared. So it's the modulus squared because that's a probability density. And basically whenever our sum passes over the random variable, that's where we're going to uh, determine that this was our x value. So as long as sum is less than this r value, we have not found our randomly selected r yet. Uh, once we do pass that, we set this measured variable equal to true, and we declare x to be that value of x list, of, of that value of the item in, in x list. And this trick works out because basically what you're doing is you're crawling along that psi modulus function. And so wherever it gets steeper, you are going to be moving more slowly. Wherever it gets shallower, you're going to be moving more quickly. Wherever that psi m gets higher, you're going to be moving more slowly. Wherever it gets lower, you're going to be moving more quickly so that you are uh, weighting the, the sampling of x values based on the psi m probability. Um, just as a diagnostic, it's going to tell us where it measured this x value. And so we now know that the particle is definitely at that x value, at least for this moment in time. For this one frame, that is where the particle definitely is. And so that's when we need to collapse the wave function. So we're going to overwrite our previous psi. So we're going to basically start over with psi. It's almost like starting the problem over with a new initial wave function. And so here's where we're going to use 
our direct delta function. We're going to set psi imaginary equal to zero. And then, of course, we need to normalize this monstrosity. So we're going to go through the same normalization process uh, that we've used before. Uh, let's click on run, and I'll show you how this works out. Um, so this function measure x is going to get triggered whenever I press this measure x button. So that's just a little trick set up in GlowScript here. Um, where we create this button, uh, we've called that uh, the, the measure x here. So we've, we're binding to this function, the measure x function. And so when I click on this, it's going to pick out an x value. Now this right here at about a half is where I'm most likely to find, so to find x. So I expect my x to be somewhere around a half. Let's click on measure x. Sure enough, we got x to be exactly half. Good job, computer. You, you behaved perfectly there. And so here I've got my direct delta function. It's pretty broad because we've got a pretty rough mesh set up here. But you notice that as soon as I click on measure x, it collapses the wave function down to the delta function, to the spike. But then it immediately starts time evolving again, right? Because the, the wave function, unless you're measuring energy, unless you get an energy eigenstate, which we'll see in the next video, the wave function cannot stand still, even on these position eigenstates. Let's try that again. Let's try measure x again. And I measured x to be 1.5. So I had a lower probability of that because the thing was low over here. Uh, let's try that again. Measure x. We get a 1.9, we move over to the right. So even if I measure x successively, I'm likely to get an x nearby, but there's no guarantee, right? Because it's a randomly determined value. Uh, in fact, I've even jumped all the way over to 0 0.5 here. So every time I measure this, I am changing the wave function, right? So I've got the wave function collapse. I pick out an energy, I, excuse me, I pick out a position eigenvalue and I collapse the wave function down to the position eigenfunction. We can do the same thing with the momentum. So here I've set up a momentum that uses the measure p uh, function. This gets into things a little bit more differently though because the momentum is not as straightforward to get out as the position. Because for position, since I'm measuring my wave function based on its position, position is easy to, uh, to determine. But because I, I, I'm measuring in a position, the momentum is more difficult to work out. Let me show you what this looks like. So we've got our random uniform variable. We're going to go through the same kind of process. But what I need now is the probability distribution for the momentum, right? The psi m up here that I was using, that's the probability distribution for the position. What I need here is the probability distribution for the momentum. So in order to do that, we're going to need to get that, uh, that momentum wave function. This is also called the momentum wave function. It's called phi. So psi is the position wave function. Phi is the momentum wave function. In order to get that, we have to take an integral. We basically have to integrate over x for each possible value of p. So I've set up a range of p values uh, just based on the step size dx here. And so what we've got here is an integral. Uh, we're integrating a complex exponential, right? So I've got the cosine and the sine uh, because your, uh, your e to the i angle is cosine plus i times the sine of the angle. And so we're, mix match, or we're, we're mixing and matching those with the psi function here. So I've got psi real times cosine, psi imaginary times sine to give me the real part. Down here I've got psi imaginary times cosine minus psi real times sine to give me the imaginary part. So the real part gets real part matched up with the real part, imaginary matched up with imaginary. The imaginary part for, uh, for this thing gives, is given by the imaginary part times the real part and the real part times the imaginary part. <sighs> That's why they call them complex numbers, folks. Um, so anyway, I end up with this phi function that is my probability distribution for the momentum. The way this ends up working is the same way that we did before for the, uh, for the position uh, random selection. We need to set up this sum here. We're going to sum over phi now instead of psi. And basically as soon as our sum exceeds this random variable, the, this previously selected random number, then we can assign that as the momentum. So it'll tell us I measured the momentum to be whatever value we randomly selected. And then down here, I need to collapse the wave function. Only this time, instead of collapsing to a direct delta function, it needs to collapse to a complex exponential. And so what I see here is that my psi real is going to become a cosine, and my psi imaginary is going to become a sine, because that's what a complex exponential is. It's cosine plus i times the sine. And so whenever I click on measure p, measure the momentum, 
Here it tells me I measure a momentum of negative 0.4, and here you've got your real part, here you've got your imaginary part, a cosine and a sine. And again, the wave function cannot stand still. It has to time evolve. So even though I've measured p, now I've got to have the thing you know, start to get wiggly again. I can measure p again. I get a different value of momentum. I got nearly zero for that momentum. That's pretty impressive. The thing that I want you to notice about this, because there's, there's a lot of stuff going on in this code that's based on the theory and all this integration stuff, but what I want you to notice about this is that whenever we measure x, we get a spike in the wave function, right? We get a spike in the wave function. The particle's definitely somewhere in this region and probably not over here. But as soon as we measure the momentum, watch what happens to the modulus, the green curve. I'm gonna click on momentum here. It becomes flat. I get a uniform probability distribution for the x. In other words, if I know exactly what the momentum is, I can't know with any certainty what the position is. And if I know what the position is, I can't know with any certainty what the momentum is. That's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So you can explore the uncertainty principle just by clicking this measure X, measure P buttons. That will demonstrate for you what this mysterious thing called the uncertainty principle really is.